<laughs> there we go. You are recording. Awesome. Well, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jacob Francisco. I am the chapter president of Janet Fairfield Sassoon. And tonight uh, we're here for the Ethnic Studies Town Hall. And the purpose of tonight is to start the discussion around ethnic studies in light of the recently adopted ethnic studies model curriculum from the State Board of Education, as well as the pending legislation, Assembly Bill 101. Now, Genep has been able to work with our partners to get significant figures in our educational community to come and participate tonight. Now, I'd like each and every panelist to please introduce themselves and their affiliation, please. My name is Michael Bloom. I'm a been a Spanish teacher at Army O High School for going on 14 years now. It's it's amazing. And uh, I've been teaching in Northern California for about 20 years. Studied also at the University of Salamanca in Spain for my second master's. Hi, I'm Ana Patero. I teach at Solano Community College. I teach public speaking. And I'm also a board member at Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District for Area 6. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm the reverse of that. I'm a teacher at FSUSD and a board member at Solomon College. My name is Quinton Voice. <laughs> and good evening, everyone. I'm Sheila McCabe. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services here in the district, Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. My name is Nancy Den. I am currently uh, president of Fairfield Sustain Unified Teachers Association and a 20 plus year teacher in the district, mostly in social sciences in the middle school. Hello, my name is Jen Rausch. I'm the Assistant Director of Curriculum and Instruction here in Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. I'm here with Dr. McCabe in partnership from Ed Services to support from the curriculum side. Awesome. Thank you again, panelists, for being here tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to participate today. And I just wanted to do a quick reminder that each of you will have about three minutes to respond to you each of the following questions. And I think without further ado, we should jump straight into the first question. Um, and I'll open it up after to whoever would like to respond to the first question. What does ethnic studies mean to you? And what do you think about when you hear the term ethnic studies? I guess I'll go since no one's going yet. <laughs> uh, but I, what ethnic studies means to me, I grew up in a different country um, from here. So uh, when I, growing up in Fiji, we were a, we didn't have um, ethnic studies per se. We had just had uh, history and history was usually European history. And so I'd never heard of ethnic studies until I came to this country and just in the, in the last few years hearing the term ethnic studies. So. Uh, it's new, I think it means uh, to me, I think it's exploring different cultures. And I think that's so wonderful considering the fact that we are a country that, of immigrants. And so when I hear uh, the term ethnic studies, I, I, what immediately comes to my mind is that it's about time. When I hear of ethnic studies, um, I remember my upbringing. My father taught Russian language and literature, spoke five different languages, and he came from Brooklyn, New York. And the cultural intermeshing of people was so intense. Just in that part of the country, you could hear six languages just crossing a street in Manhattan. Uh, but I think that ethnic studies should delve into cultures, customs, history, and politics of a variety of people from as many origins as possible. You know, for me, um, I grew up just down the street here in Dixon, and we really, the town at that point in time was really bicultural. You were either um, white or you were Hispanic or Latinx. And um, while, our, while our history books were very much so focused on um, European culture, Eurocentric 
um, learning the environment that we lived in just because of how we all we were, we we're a small class and all of us got along and we learned a lot about each other's culture through that process. But I really think it was when I was working on my master's in education that I started to really understand that concept of ethnic studies. Um, we read a book in it called A Different Mirror. And in the book, they took major historical um, situations that happened, major historical experiences experiences and began telling the story from the different perspectives. And it was the first time I think I ever thought of history in something other than that Eurocentric viewpoint that we got when we were in school. And so for me, the movement that is happening right now in California around a focus on, on ethnic studies, I think is so important, especially because we are even just here in Fairfield, yes, as, a, as the United States, but even here in the Fairfield Sassoon community, we're such a much multicultural community. And I think that our ability to understand and appreciate and respect other cultures becomes really important as we um, learn how to work with each other in being respectful to each other and really appreciating the stories of our cultures. Ms. Roush or Ms. Dunn, did you want to add anything? Um, I'll, uh, in addition to, to not repeat what others have said, um, when I think about ethnic studies, um, I was uh, at UC Davis in the history department when they first started actually having um, classes and the ability to focus your degrees on um, Chicano studies or uh, Black studies. And um, so it was a very exciting time to be part of that um, initial academic look at um, how history and social science is looked at um, in a really changing lens and to sort of be in the early stages of that. I know for myself, I was uh, getting my degree in women's history and there was no such thing at the time. And so I had to get my master's in American history with, uh, but having done all of my work and research and thesis on women's history. Um, and so to me, it reminds me of a very exciting time in an academic area that I feel absolutely passionate about. I think I'll just add, I'm, I'm also a school librarian, a teacher librarian, and that, um, that lens of collection development and collecting things together is um, something that I hold near and dear to my heart. And when I think about ethnic studies and I think about the model curriculum guidelines as well, it's ensuring that you are looking at that variety of cultures and experiences and, and taking all of those different studies and bringing them together to inform your, your civic engagement and how we engage with our Fairfield Sassoon community as students and staff. I think you guys, everyone in this uh, panel has brought up a lot, of, a lot of really good points. And I think the, you know, we should be centering around this idea of how does it impact students, which kind of leads me into our second question. Um, how do you believe ethnic studies can impact our students' ability to be prepared in a quote, ever-changing world? That question gave me a lot of time to think and reflect. And what I came up with is if it's taught in an open and all encompassing approach, it should enlighten students to be equipped with a wise and empathetic outlook on as many people that our graduates will have the chance to encounter and develop real relationships with. It'll be a, an environment of understanding and that's what we really need. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. No, I was just going to say I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and I also think if an ethnic studies course is taught well, that it encourages individuals to really become critical thinkers and become global thinkers. 
And to me, both of those attributes are so important when we live in a multicultural society. And particularly, we live in a society that is rapidly changing. You know, even if we think back and, and Francisco as a, um, Francisco Jacob as a senior in as a senior in high school, if you think back to even what life was like when you were a sixth grader and how much different our society is today than what it was then. And each year we just go, we get faster and faster in those kinds of changes that happen. And I think that when we when you have um, those critical thinking skills and global thinking, it makes you stronger in how you're able to contribute to your society, whether that's your local community or even greater. Nancy, you wanna say something? Well, actually I was gonna say something very similar when I think when you look at the question and and it is without a doubt a true statement that we are in not only an ever-changing world, but a rapidly shifting world, that the way you prepare is by having the skills uh, to know what adaptation is like and how to critically approach decision-making because it's the idea of shifting from a fact-based system to a skill-based system. And I think that ethnic studies as part of social studies in general uh, develops those kinds of critical thinking, analytical skills, um, looking at uh, information in a way to pass a judgment on its value. And I think that when an ethnic studies program is part of an overall social science curriculum, that it adds those skills that are necessary because we don't know how the world is going to change. So we can't really prepare for what those changes are, but we can prepare for learning how to deal with change. That's a really good point. And it's that change, sorry, Ms. Don, I didn't mean to call you by your first name. And, and, and how we, we change, there's a phrase that I teach in my intercultural, in a uh, personal communication class in the intercultural component of it is, and that is um, intercultural competence. You know, and your generation is just so, uh, you're so fortunate that you grew up with so many different cultures, you know, when from ever since we had, you know, from the night from 1954, uh, the or 1957, the Board of Brown versus Board of Education, where, where they were integrating schools, and then they started integrating classes. And then so each generation built upon each other. And now we get to your generation, if you think about, you know, protests that have happened over the years, right? And you think about this last year when all of these young people went out of protest, it seems as though ethnic studies is catching up to your generation because you grew up with so many people with different abilities, different genders, different cultures, different groups, and, and among the different ages, because we're now, I mean, it's not uncommon now to have like four generations of families living. And this, every once in a while you have five generations. So all of that intertwined, like they call it intersectionality, if you will. And so your, your generation has grown up with all of that. And so last year when they saw you all come out to protest, you, you know people from different, from different cultures and everybody was supportive of one another. So I think um, bringing ethnic studies, the impact it can have on students, I think the students will have an impact in ethnic studies because each of you can tell your own story. You all have your own individual narratives that you can bring to this, to uh, a class like ethnic studies and that's why I always tell your generation don't let anybody diminish the value of your experience because while you know some people you, you, you're an expert when you get to Dr. McCabe's position she's a, she's it has, has is a doctorate they become expert in specific position in specific uh, subjects right you have master's degrees or bachelor's degrees but look at all of our experiences it doesn't diminish the value of yours Right. So I think uh, ethnic studies is catching up to your generation. I think it'll have a great impact on, on, on our ever changing world. And that's because your generation is leading the world in uh, in, in intercultural co uh, competence because you have so many different uh, exchanges, experiences, friends and family. I would imagine that many of you, our families are interracial, intercultural, international. Right. So that's my two cents. I'm going to attempt to follow such passion um, because I absolutely agree with what you're saying and this idea that 
ethnic studies is, is really rooted in the history social science framework and in the common core literacy standards that is focused on inquiry, focused on asking questions and then having the tools to be able to do that research, find, recommend a solution, try something out. And when we were bridging what Ms. Dunn said and what Ms. Patero said, this idea of, of how those two come together in a course can be really powerful. I think one of the interesting things that Ms. Patero brought up was this idea of culture. And that's kind of a really good segue to our, our third question. You know, to what extent do you believe being informed about different cultures allows a student to be more respectful of them? And this kind of question was actually written maybe two months ago. And in light of all the recent um, hate crimes that happened down in Georgia, I think this is, has been really uh, kind of altered in the way that everyone is going to be answering tonight versus when we thought we were going to originally ask. So I leave it to you all and open up the floor to uh, for you all to answer. That question really left a, a passionate response with me. Um, my wife is African-American. My mother is Irish. Uh, my brother Mark's wife is um, from China. Um, and I really, if I were to use a religious term, I really want to pray for the people that have been on earth the longest because they're the ones that have to adapt and it's more difficult for them than we do. We prepare and look because of so many changes that are going on. We have the ability to adapt, whereas they're a little more, to use a language term, fossilized. And um, being informed of various cultures uh, opens an interchange between everybody. It creates relationship. It creates a spirit of empathy. And uh, the the... The goal that I always wanted is not a, a feeling of nationalism, but of world nationalism. As a whole culture, the whole world, if we can reach to that point where there's empathy, not just tolerance, but empathy uh, between people to get along. Uh, my family is struggling about that, but I won't get into those details. Um, empathy and a sense of world community will make us really happen as a world. That's what we need. That's what we have to, uh, to rise up to. And uh, uh, this, the, this type of coursework is a start to all that. I would add that I think that part of the purpose of education is just to create um, significant human beings, that the educational system isn't just about teaching certain academic subjects, but that there is a role that education plays in just helping to uh, create the human beings that we want to be making decisions about our planet um, moving forward and all of the cultural cultures and societies that are on that planet. And so I think courses and ethnic studies would be one that would fall in that, that just help develop um, children into becoming um, respectful, um, caring uh, adults is an important work. And when we, when we talk about students, sometimes we talk about educating the whole child. Um, and I think that ethnic studies um, is something that is important when we're talking about just developing good human beings, uh, which I think is one of the goals of education. You know, growing up in Fiji, uh, we didn't, we don't, um, we had, we celebrated all of the, the the holidays. So we had lots of holidays, and we celebrated every religion. So we would have Diwali, we'd Hindu, we'd have uh, Easter, we would have Ramadan, we would have just all of. And, and it was so fun because we got to, uh, and we had friends from different cultures. And with little kids, what was so fun is when you go to these different family gatherings and different cultural celebrations, they all have candy. 
So we got to, so all of our friends had fr had friends of different cultures, and and our common uh, interest was because we had candy. They all had candy, and so you got to learn a lot about the different cultures uh, from just uh, just from, from from cultural celebrations. And that's the thing that I appreciated about growing up in the islands, is that we got to learn so much about uh, about the world uh, because we're such a small country. It's fascinating. My husband is American, and a, lot, a while while ago I. A long time ago, I asked him, I said, you know, how is it that you Americans, <laughs> Americans don't know much about so many other cultures, but we know about just about every culture. We study geography and everything. He goes, well, because we don't have to know. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, because we're a superpower. Everybody wants to come to America. So why do we need to learn about other cultures? That's the frame of mind, right? I thought, that's really fascinating. And then now that so many different cultures are here, and we hear 350 different languages spoken in the United States, I think that makes this country richer. And I think just being informed about different cultures, we have that richness right here. And I think that just uh, is, is great. And then having friends from different cultures and the like, and especially living longer generations, I think is helpful. We, this is how you, this is how they respect their parents. This is how they, they treat their grandparents. When you go into somebody's house, you remove your shoes. You know, something like that, you know, some some families would eat with a knife and fork. I worked for a Japanese com uh, company about in the 1980s and and in the 80s, the chopsticks and the hair were all the rage. So I wore chopsticks in my hair once and I working for Fujitsu, I didn't even think about this. Talk about culturally insensitive, right? Walk into the office and one of the uh, engineers said to me, how would you like it if I wore a knife and fork in my hair? And I went, what do you mean? He goes, and I, just went, and I went, oh my gosh, how insensitive me. I mean, walking to a Japanese company with chopsticks in your hair. This is why we need to be informed about different cultures. Good. Um, so this is gonna be like true confession. My guilty pleasure is watching Bravo Real Housewives. And I can tell you a little bit about every one of the series because that's my brainless TV that I go home to and watch. And in some of the sessions and one of the lines that has become really popular in there is I see you, I see you. And when they're in some kind of conflict with each other, it's I see you, I see you. I was talking with one of the professors at Toro University this summer. And as we were talking through some items, she used that same expression and said, it's so important because I, except it was, this was the, the gesture, I see you. And she goes, sometimes in our cultures, um, individuals forget to see you. And it was, it was one of those moments when you're in a conversation and you just kind of have to pause and go, there's so much more to that, those words of, I see you. And to me, at least, why it is so important to be informed about the different cultures is because it's about not seeing who we are as you're looking on the screen, but it's about seeing you and recognizing that each one of us has a story and that story includes our culture, our rituals, our traditions of our family, and that it's when we truly value and see those items in an individual that I think that it allows us to have greater respect. And so instead of it just being what we see on the surface, it's knowing that each one of us comes with a different story that impacts the decisions that we make, that impact how we treat each other, and that the more that we know of each other's stories, I think more often than not, we, we um, I think we're, we're kinder to individuals when we truly appreciate what their stories are. But I loved that I see you yeah, and yeah. I thought, oh, that, that was important to me. Speaking of seeing you about seven, eight years ago, no, longer than that actually, um, I took a summer course of Spanish in, um, in Mexico, in, in the state of Guanajuato. And this family, I, because I, I had some experience in traveling, this family um, allowed me and a bunch of other students to, to stay in their house. They had rooms and we took classes in the town and, and everything else. And, and the students just went about their business and did things like they would if they were in, in the US. Um, but my approach was to, to look at the family and say, you know, they're inviting people to come into their homes. 
how do they see how we're acting from their point of view? And can I adjust that action so it's more comfortable for them to be so inviting? I'd have to know something about life and customs and where people are coming from and the history that they had to put up with in order for me to adjust myself so that we can be creating an authentic relationship and just, instead of just nodding your head and saying, have a nice day, you know? So you, you have to take it slow. You have to take it empathetic. You have to have an understanding of history of where each country has come from in order for you to adjust yourself so that you can meet evenly and communicate with each other. And that takes a lot of work to gain that level of respect. And that's, uh, you know, a course like this might help. Well, I think a lot of us in, in this panel address kind of our next question even before I got to it. And it's the idea of how important is it to learn about other cultures? Um, I know like a lot of you already talked about how important, uh, you know, learning about these cultures are, excuse the background noise, but is there, is there any, is there anything else that maybe other panelists might want to add on to how important learning cultures are? I think I just want to add to it. Um, one of my core beliefs is the idea that we need mirrors and we need windows in what we're reading and what we're experiencing. And um, for a lot of our students, for a lot of um, growing up myself, I had a lot of mirrors. I saw I could see myself in my curriculum. I could see myself in the books I found in my library. There weren't a lot of windows for me, right? There weren't a lot of windows into other cultures, other ethnicities, other experiences, and you had to seek them out intentionally. And I think about what that was like for me versus a student who goes through their whole life, or as many of you, I'm guessing on this panel too, that just, you know, you, maybe you had a lot of mirrors, but what about that kid that only had windows? And that courses that, um, especially with the FAIR Act, this idea of having fair and accurate and inclusive and respectful curriculum, especially in the history social sciences, but my personal belief across the board, what an opportunity to also have some mirrors and some windows for all students and not, and not just some. And Jake, if, if I can just add, I think that, and I don't know if it was Ms. Butero or Ms. Dunn that mentioned about um, the community piece around, um, you know, focus of ethnic studies and what that can do for a community. And, and I just, when, especially when I saw this question, that's what I really thought about is that I think that when you have a greater understanding of other cultures, it makes your community, your entire community, a stronger community. And so to me, that's one of the reasons why that type of learning is so important, why the, the curriculum is so important, because I do really think that it builds stronger communities. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You know, uh, I wanna say the late, early eighties, uh, but talk about learning other cultures and the like, I was standing at a, at a bank, when, back when people used to go into banks and stand in line, I was standing in line with my mother and I was speaking to her in Fijian and in front of me was a couple and they were speaking to each other in Spanish. And behind us was another couple, they were speaking to each other in a different language. And this person, Caucasian man, way in the front of the line turned around and he goes, am I still in America? And I looked at him and he goes, that is precisely where you are and that is exactly why you hear all these different languages. And he turned around and went back. You know, and we, I mean, that's 40 years ago, come to now, 2020, 2021, and we're just now exploring ethnic studies. It's about time. And that's why I think your generation's leading the way and it's so important. And we need to catch up with you. You know, that's interesting that you're having a town hall with adults talking about ethnic studies <laughs> when there's so much that we can learn from you. The fact that you're putting this on, you know, and with just very, very diverse group here speaks to just how amazing you all are in terms of leading the way in talking about the importance of learning about other cultures. So I just want to thank you up front for that. So one very short thing I will add to this is I think 
that it's important to learn about other cultures because too often we can draw conclusions based on an individual and then um, expand that out to how that one individual might or might not represent a culture. And so it's important to actually learn about cultures and not just draw uh, assumptions for ourselves that may very well be inaccurate based on a single or a handful of interactions with people fr from a certain culture or area or geographic region or lifestyle or anything else. And so to actually systematically learn about a culture elevates it to that, um, in a way, community level of, of for better or worse, you're not drawing conclusions based on single or limited interactions. Here, here. And, you know, we've been talking about this idea of culture and uh, I wanted to, you know, we focus us back to um, the idea of ethnic studies and Dr. McCabe and Ms. Roush here, you guys are aware that we do have um, some ethnic studies. And I really wanna pose the question, how do you think we can implement more ethnic studies in our district? You know, I'm actually proud of the fact that we've already got four courses that are being taught that I would say have a focus on ethnic studies. So we don't have um, what one might call a survey course titled ethnic studies, but we do have courses at our high school that incorporate those components of ethnic studies. And it's really because we have um, teachers in our district that brought forward ideas saying, you know, we think that our kids would really benefit from a course in this particular area and wrote up the syllabuses and took, took the courses through the process. And um, we have them that meet the English requirements, social science requirements, and also meet the UCCSU requirements. And so I'm, I'm proud of that. It doesn't mean that we don't have more work in front of us, but I'm proud of the fact that even before the state, um, the state board of education adopted something saying we should have it, it's been something, uh, Ms. Roush, two, year, two years now we've had the courses that we've been offering in the district. In terms of having more, it's really just a matter of where the interest is. I, I will say that a lot of the work weighs heavy on the teachers for that. Um, Mrs. Dunn can probably speak to that piece of it too in her role, but more often than not, it's a syllabus that's developed and then is submitted. We have a curriculum council that's made up of students and staff and um, we have parents and I believe they've had a community representative on, the, on that panel. And um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm gonna let you talk about that process because you're very involved in it, Ms. Roush. I, I, was a, I was getting ready to say, Dr. McCabe did such a great job <laughs> exp explaining all of this, but it's true. We do have a, a curriculum council in Fairfield Sassoon and we do have community members. In fact, one of our um, Solano County librarians is also on the, panel and classified staff as well. And each year through a, a variety of processes, sometimes we have entire new course proposals that are brought forward to curriculum council that have the, a full curriculum guide. That is how race and social justice came through as, a, as an option for the history requirement for 11th grade students. That's how all four English language arts options for 12th grade students came through. And then just recently this year, um, Semiato has some new English language arts courses as well. The other piece of it too is what materials are being used in any course in Fairfield Sassoon. And so we've had some different supplemental materials or different novels that have come through as well, really with, with the focus on having some culturally responsive options and having some different opportunities for curriculum. And I think we might talk about it later, but the adoption of any new materials also comes through Curriculum Council, including the, the history social science materials that were adopted in the last couple of years. And I, I will say that um, we revised the rubric and the adoption process when we went through the history social science materials to include not only professional development for our pilot teachers, we partnered with UC Davis History Project to ensure that teachers understood what, what does it mean to in, 
to ensure that we're fair act aligned? What does it mean to ensure that we're using the history social science framework to guide how we are teaching in Fairfield Sassoon? But in addition to that PD and in addition to selecting instructional materials, the teachers in that group also recommended some supplemental materials because textbooks aren't one size fits all. Sometimes, you know, you they don't have everything just right. And we went through and selected some supplemental materials that can be translated and that are primary sources to really ensure that our teachers and students have fair act aligned materials and representative materials available. So those already exist in the district and are, are being incorporated into the curriculum guides for history, social science. Um, the high, uh, high school, their curriculum guides are significantly more developed. We're working with our K-8 teachers right now on that process. Um, and so I think that yes, it is implementing more ethnic studies whether it's at the course level or whether it's at what's happening within the courses that already exist. Um, can you, Ms. Roush, can you explain, because you've used the term a couple of times, so I'm going to have you just explain what the FAIR Act, when you say the FAIR Act, what that is. Absolutely. So the FAIR Act is legislation that came through in California all the way back in 2012. And FAIR stands for, I'm going to look at it because I don't want to get it wrong, FAIR, Accurate, Inclusive, and Respectful. And while it specifically pertains to history social science curriculum, I just wanna point out that language was added to it and it's part of education code as well that specifically says that when we have instruction in social studies, that we're making sure that we're looking at the role and the contributions of both men and women, Native Americans, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, European Americans, and the new language added in was lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans and persons with disabilities and members of other ethnic and cultural groups. And specifically, I know I'm going on here, but just stay with me, specifically looking at how these groups have contributed to California and the United States and looking at them in our contemporary society today. So that can and should, and we are continuing to support our teachers with professional development on, ma on making sure that when we are looking at history, social science in our district, that we're fair act aligned and using the framework in our instruction. And then if I could just have her talk about one other piece, I know this is way longer than the three minutes, Jacob, and I apologize, but um, one of the other pieces that the committee put together, because We've had a curriculum committee. I think I've now been in the district 12 or 13 years. We've had a curriculum committee the, the, all the years I've been here, but we've never had one that's as formalized as what has been put together in our current curriculum instruction and assessment department, where we really have stakeholders from various groups that are looking at the, the courses and the curriculum being adopted. One of the components, and it really is aligning to the work that we're that we're working on in terms of equity in our district is to have a, an equity task force within that curriculum council. Can you just take a, a minute or two and talk about that piece? Because I think that that becomes a lens also for the ethnic studies. Absolutely. So what was so great is our, our curriculum council, we have new people join each year and some people cycle out each year. And at the beginning of this year, loud and clear, the, the group said, we want a task force because not only do we want to make sure we have a rubric where we're looking at new materials that are being adopted, but what do we do with the materials that we already have and the ones that we're going to adopt in the future? So we formed a task force that really did some research and looked at um, equity rubrics for curriculum that were already out there um, and available online. And we went through the process of figuring out how we can develop an equity rubric for the district that can be made available for teachers and sites to look at what is currently being taught, what's currently our board adopted materials for English language arts or history, social science to help inform their instruction. Not to say um, that we were that we're removing anything from the curriculum, but to look at it critically and think what do we need to add or, or how can we teach this in a different way 
to ensure that we are using the right lens. And so it's still in draft form and it's gone through that process where we had teachers and parents and administrators and I think some classified staff as well in the group that were making these recommendations and it's gone back to curriculum council and we're, we're hoping to get it in place for this upcoming school year. Are you all considering authors of different ethnicities when you look at this, when you look at the, the, the books, the curriculum and the like? Yeah, you know, it was really interesting. One of the, um, and right, li librarian hat as well. In the, in the library world, we also have an equity audit where you go through and you look at the, the race and the ethnicity and the background and, and male versus female of the author as well as the main character. And that was definitely, that's one of the checklists that we have linked into this equity rubric is not only looking at who is telling the story and who is writing the materials, but also how is the, the character or the, the actual person being portrayed within the story. So yes, that is included. There seems that's to be a- Go ahead. There's, there's, I'm sorry. Um, just a media reaction. There seems to be a lot of very strong work in curriculum, but do you look also at the teachers who are teaching it, their intent, their goals that they have in mind, as a, a, if it reflects the inclusiveness that ethnic studies courses would have? I, I think that that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, and I think that it is an, an ongoing process for, for individuals and for the district because professional development is absolutely around changing that mindset and establishing and explaining the why. And I think there's lots of different places in the district where we're, we're working on that as well is, is how can we support both the planning and the implementation because we know materials are just one piece of it. So I don't have the perfect, the perfect answer. Go ahead, Dr. McCabe, I know you wanna jump in. No, I was just going to say, because I think that's one of the benefits in the fact that it's been uh, slow, like slow for us. So we didn't jump in and say across the board, all U.S. history is changing to something different. And so in many cases, and I think this actually might feed into one of Jacob's um, upcoming questions, but in many cases, it's been the teachers that have been very interested in getting the courses on the books that have also then been the ones that are teaching those courses. And so there is a, a passion and a love for the content that is then also being transferred to what they're providing within the classroom. It was interesting because when Ms. Roush and I were talking earlier today and, and you know how many courses do we have at each one of the different high schools? And one of the conversations that came up was around one high school had, um, well, at least one teacher there with very strong skill set in this particular area and another high school that didn't have anybody with as strong as a skill set. And it was actually the teacher at the one high school who said, then, then we're, I'm going to use different words probably than what the teacher used, but I, then we're going to coach you up. We're going to coach you up and get you ready so that you can provide this. Um, but it really became because of, of um, a, a fantastic teacher at one of our schools that has this as a real passion and is helping us um, have qual have the quality the course being a quality at other schools. I don't mean to cut anyone's response off. I think we've been on this uh, question, you know, kind of for a long time. And I really want to jump to question eight. I know it's kind of out of order, but I really want to jump to question eight because you brought up kind of that, um, you know, teachers are the ones that are interested and they will be the ones to teach it. And so kind of asking the teachers now, are you a fan of the history being taught to students currently? And if you could please elaborate on your stance. Well, I, I believe I might be the history teacher on the panel. So I will definitely uh, speak up on this one. Um, so I, I'm glad I get to elaborate, but my short answer is no. <laughs> I am not a fan um, of the way current uh, history is currently being um, taught. And I want to start out by saying that that is not in any way a um, slight against the history teachers who are teaching um, or the curriculum that has been adopted by the district. Um, because we can only 
adopt curriculum that has already been approved by the state. And so there, we start with a limited pool of resources from which to choose for state adopted curriculum. Um, what I want to spend time talking about though is one of the things that is most disturbing to me is that we have, um, I think not only in our district, but in many districts um, at the elementary level set aside um, a real focus on history as being one of the core subjects. Um, it's a side effect, I believe, of the fact that it isn't state tested except for at um, a couple of grade levels. And so we tend to focus very much on um, mathematics and English language arts. And I will tell you, it was a blow to the heart, I believe, of every history social science teacher when we basically had our discipline sort of just um, subsumed into the ELA um, content standards and that social science and history was going to be sort of a subset of, of English language arts. Um, and I can understand that on one level because um, history really is about critical thinking skills, critical writing, analytical abilities. And, um, but it is at the same time distinct in its discipline and approach from language arts. So again, this is nothing against a particular district or state. It is, well, it's kind of against the state of California and how they did that. But um, it is too easy and it is too often that in our elementary level classrooms, there is um, not a lot of time or energy uh, given to teaching history and social science. It gets um, a day a week. It gets part of an English lesson. It gets to be um, uh, something that uh, in the past, uh, elementary teachers have even been told by principals, oh, if you don't have enough grades for that on the report card, just put an asterisk by it or just leave it blank. If we are going to truly develop um, an ethnic studies program, Part of the, uh, what was said by an earlier speaker is part of it comes from the desire uh, for people to teach it and interest of students to have it. Well, if we don't start developing that interest in history and social science and um, all of the pieces of social science like sociology, anthropology, cultural anthropology, then we're not going to have that interest either by students or teachers. Um, to bring this forward. So I am here to be a unabashed history nerd and uh, history nerds want, you know, their just time in every, every elementary classroom and not sort of have it show up as like, oh, I mean, as a seventh grade teacher and an eighth grade teacher, I will tell you, I had students who came into my classroom and they're like, oh, we finally get to have history. Well, that means you spent your entire elementary career not really seeing that as a curricular area. So I will now stop and let somebody somebody else have a have a turn. But to me, it is this is like one of my passions. This is a huge uh, part for me that we have got to start elevating this academic area in the elementary classroom. At a total, totally different level, but paralleling the intent of what Ms. Dunn said, um, I studied for two years at the University of Salamanca. And in each of those years, there was the history of Spain that was taught along with grammar, along with culture, along with all those other things. And if you didn't understand how people approached you in Spain because of their history, they looked at me and, you know, we had the president, we had the past four years, I won't say his name for the, uh, to avoid uh, as much political reference as I'd like to make, but I won't do it. Um, they said, what's going on in your country? And they had a little smirk on their face. It, the smirk on their face is because they had a downturn in their economy. They had a person who was an authoritarian come and rule in their country. They had a left-wing 
version of what their country wanted to be. And then they finally pulled away from it and finally just developed their own version of a democracy afterwards. So they saw us going through the exact same pains they went through 40, 50 years ago. Um, and I have such a greater understanding of what people meant when they asked me that question, when I consider their history. If you don't have the history, you don't have where people come from, you're clueless. That's why it's important. And when you don't teach history, we tend to repeat itself, right? You think, and from whose perspective are we teaching history, right? Because it seems that though those who get to write the books get to dictate what history looks like. You know, and that's why it's so important to have ethnic studies. You know, we go we look at the, uh, again, coming from the islands, we were colonized. You know, you come from the, from, from the perspective of the colonizers, co colonizers, well, we're liberators. You know, what are you liberating us from? Our language, you're liberating us from our food, you're liberating us from our culture. That's what happened to the Hawaiians. That's what happened to the Maoris. That's what happened to the Aborigines in Australia. They push them aside. And then you have to ask permission to come back into mainstream society. Look at what happened to the Native Americans here, right? And so that is so why it's so, so important. And as Mr. Bloom said, when you're studying history from an elementary level, because there's, and then you don't need, you don't need as much culture because history intertwines with culture. And as Ms. Dunn said, cultural anthropology is, it is ethnic studies. You get to learn about different cultures, how to interact with them, you know. And then in addition to language, you understand the nuances of that particular language, a particular language, you know, how we say words, the idioms. Like think about, for example, here, if I were to say, hey, by the way, so-and-so kicked the bucket. And we all know that somebody died, right? But a person who is learning English for the very first time is like, why did they kick the bucket? You know, and so words and language is one thing, but learning the nuances of that culture is another thing. And so it should be taught at a very young age. And also, I, I think we have dual emerging classes here, which is great because studies have also shown that children can be, uh, can be native speakers in multiple languages up until the age of 13, 14 years old because your tongues are more malleable. You know, there's a little polygot, she's a little Russian girl, she can speak eight languages before she was five. Just that alone is so important. History should be taught on its own. Geography should be taught on its own. English should be taught on its own. And by the way, why are we teaching English? We don't have, you know, there is no national language. English is not a national language in the United States. So if anything, English, the, what we teach here should be, you know, it's effectively British English. We don't have a, so American English or history or whatever, should be an ethnic studies, if you will, because it's a combination of a little bit of everything, right? So I, I keep thinking about that. It's like, we are doing English testing, but we don't have English as a national language. Think about how many people actually speak standard American English. So many people say, I should have went, as opposed to I should have gone. Just little things like that. I've proved, as opposed to I've, I've proven. So the fact that we don't all speak standard American English, and they're all different kinds of English, Chicano English, Af you know, uh, Black English, and every uh, form of, of language has its own has its own rules. We should accept all of those. And studying history and ethnic studies, I think, is is, is so important. I think just rethinking the way we teach all of our subjects, you know, and separate them. Like, I, I was shocked with here that we that in, that history is not a subject taught on its own just because you can't test it, and that's why we wind up with insurrections because we don't study our history. Anyway, there is my two cents again. Make that three. On a humorous note, I kept thinking as you were talking about the different kinds of English, I kept thinking now we have text English. Yes, that's so true. Because it has completely changed how some individuals communicate now. My, this next generation, going to, they're going to communicate in acronyms. And just for clarification, we, um, the, the, a discrete course in social sciences does start at seventh grade. It's at the it's at the um, elementary level. Well, I should say seventh grade in a middle school, comprehensive middle school. You know, and that's fascinating because like, I remember, like you know, like, I teach speech and just ask I'd ask students, "Have you heard of Sojourner Truth? Have you heard of Ida Ida B. Wells?" And a lot of them say no. Maybe two or three of them. I was like, my goodness, and I, I am surprised. And so it was like we need to really focus on ethnic studies on the 
an, on an elementary level coming through high school and boy, and just the richness of history. Again, as, as Ms. Dunn said, if we learned history, we would know that those big monuments that they erected in, in the South to these, these Southern generals didn't happen in the Civil War. It was to celebrate them, like the losers get the trophies and that's what we study in history. So again, going back to it depends on who writes, who gets the pen, they get to de 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 decide what story is going to be told, right? So. Well, and it, it is true that even during my time in this district, when I was teaching elementary school, there was a history social science focus at each grade level. Um, starting with, you know, knowing my community to knowing my state to fifth grade revolutionary war and constitution. So while there, you know, you don't really get into distinct classes until middle school, there is a, a curriculum in history, social science at all of the elementary grade levels. And it appears on the elementary report card. I, I want to jump in and say, sometimes I have to remind myself that it can take a long time to shift a culture. And Nancy, I hear you. And with these, with these new materials and working with Curriculum Council, I think this is a great piece of information to bring back to Curriculum Council because we do have a plan to finish writing out and to implement and to provide training and support around curriculum maps for history, social science in K-8. I say K-8 because middle grades needs this new one to go with the new materials. And um, the, the shift, you've given me a lot to think about of the shift of how do we begin to build that process with our, with our elementary teachers to ensure that those curriculum guides and maps are successful and meet the history social science standards for K-8 as well. So I have it, I wrote it down in my notes and it will be on our next curriculum council agenda as well. And this, I do want to pause history, this history nerd thanks you. I do want to pause the conversation on elementary and, and uh, secondary because that is actually a coming up question. But I, you know, Ms. Matero brought up this idea of, you know, ethnic studies should be taught at, you know, multiple levels. But kind of to go along with that, what kinds of ethnic studies, like what culture should we, we should we be representing in the ethnic studies courses that we maybe uh, offer in the future? You know, I'm gonna jump in because I think that's so fascinating with what the state board just recently did because there has been so much debate over what's supposed to be happening. And basically what they did is they shifted the responsibility to each local community around which, what are the ethnic study courses that should be in your, or what culture should be included and really has now left that to local communities to decide based on what's in the local community. To me, it's one of the reasons why I'm very grateful that we have the curriculum council because I think that gives the great platform for us to engage in that conversation here in our community and say, what are those, what are those um, cultures that we wanna make sure are included in the curriculum that we're providing? But I do think, I, I think it speaks to really, even though, um, even though everybody in our panel is saying, yes, we need to have an ethnic studies course. I think the fact that the state board really shifted that responsibility to the, to the local, um, the LEAs, our, our local communities. And you know, it's been a topic that has been at the board for a long time now and has, has had very different opinions at the state level. And so in some articles that you read, it talks about the fact that it, it has now shifted that um, some might say debate rather than discussion to the local level. But I, I feel confident that we have a process to be able to really um, hear from our community around what, we, what they think is important for us as we move forward with this. I'm gonna jump in here because I've been waiting for this question. <laughs> I um, am going to present a bit of an outlier point of view here. Um, I actually think in some ways the state got it wrong. And I think we should not be approaching ethnic studies by, by having a list of what cultures are going to be included or not included in ethnic studies, because to me, that's just another form of inclusion and exclusion. Um, I think that a better approach, an approach that I wish had been more forthcoming was to look at things like power, um, to look at things like um, 
uh, uh, cultural uh, societal structures and then look at a variety look so look at it sort of from that point of view and then look at how that is manifested or shown in multiple different cultures because i very much am concerned by are you are we going to pick the this culture gets represented in ethnic studies but we're not going to be picking every culture and is one highlighted more than another and and if we were instead taking this uh, approach of looking at systems and systems that are in cultures and seeing how do those systems appear, we would be getting the, um, we would be getting a, uh, the information about the cultures by looking at it through the systems rather than, okay, okay, to this month is, you know, uh, indigenous people. And next month it's going to be Chicano. And next month, to me, I wish that the approach had been, uh, instead of creating lists of what cultures to include and exclude, they had just taken a very different approach of, of looking at, um, at, at uh, again, the systems, the patterns, and we do actually already have that as a, as a format in one grade level in history, which is how we teach seventh grade. Seventh grade history in the curriculum is the only one that takes a period of time, travels around the world and looks at it by what is the economy? What is the religion? What is the political structure? And every other course in history in our state adopted curriculum is sort of a linear march through time. And then you get this seventh grade um, year where you just spin around the world in the same basically thousand years. And so I had the opportunity to approach history from this systems approach. And I wish that that had been applied to the ethnic studies curriculum. That's brilliant. You know, um, I think also in, in, in incorporating that, if you had a, a, a class in like intercultural communication, because if you think about now, we, we, we all speak differently because of our different cultures, right? And we're learning how uh, just the cadence for one thing. I remember there was a, a study that was done with uh, English uh, women who worked in the cafeteria and Indian men who worked, there were businessmen who were living in England at the time. And so they, the men came through and they were getting their lunch. And after the, the, the whole the exchange happened, they, they, they interviewed all of them and the English women thought the Indian men, these East Indian, by the way, were very abrupt and very rude because they, they their, their, their cadence was very choppy, but, but that was the, the way that they spoke in Hindi. And then when they translated, when they spoke in English, the accent didn't change, but the words changed, right? So if you look at, at intercultural communication holistically, you can talk about individualist cultures and, and, and collectivist cultures and build from there, like Ms. Dunn was saying, and then like, how do different cultures listen? You know, uh, how what not in terms of nonverbal communication, for example, in some cultures, eye contact is is if it's they're very hierarchical, it's rude to make eye contact, you know, and some cultures, it you don't speak until you're spoken to. And so I think learning those uh, verbal nonverbal communication, uh, conflict management within the cultures and, and between cultures, I think it's so important. So you have an umbrella course and within that course, teach about intercultural, uh, intercultural competence and teach about uh, listening, teach about interpretation, uh, how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive others within our cultures. Talk about language, talk about nonverbal communication. How do we listen and how do we, do we hear? Because men and women listen very differently. For one thing, you add culture to that and add gender and add, add uh, uh, age to that, all of those. I think is so important. And you talk about emotions and how we express emotions. Some people recoil, some people in terms of emotions, they are uh, uh, very, very expressive and very passionate. And that gets misinterpreted, you know, as being aggressive, but that's just the way they speak. I'll give you an example. Uh, we were uh, in, when I coached the speech and debate team, 
we were we got out of out of our competition really late. We went to this uh, Chinese restaurant, and one of our students happened to be Chinese, and she and I go, man, we're never going to get into that restaurant. And so she goes, and let me go. So we're the whole team standing outside. We hear them talking. It's like, oh my gosh, she's screaming at her, yelling at each other. She comes back and goes, okay, they're getting ready for, for us to eat right now. We go, they weren't mad at us. Oh no, we were just having a conversation. So the fact that they were communicating what we thought was loudly was them enjoying it themselves, right? I mean, think about the movie. There's a, go, a movie that Jacob, you may not know about. It's called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Yes. You know, and so you have this very you know, uh, nuclear family, one child, and they come into this family, just like very, you know, uh, poised, very, you know, polite. And then you have this other family, the Greek family, a lot of them, you know, in generations, and they're very happy. Everybody has to have a drink. You know, everybody has to do this. And they just, it was like culture shock. So I think when you look at intercultural communication or you look at ethnic studies holistically, and then I think we get to, we'll, we'll learn more about each other, how we communicate with each other, and then be able to get along better. Because we're, there's, we have so much more in common than we do different, right? Noam Chomsky, who is a noted linguist, said that humans can only make a finite amount of sounds. We don't want to make 5,000 sounds. So if you think about it that way, we have more in common than we have different. So if you approach ethnic studies from that umbrella, Students can learn, you know, if somebody's acting a different way, oh, that's just, that's the way they, they behave. This is this particular culture, right? As opposed to picking and choosing which culture gets represented, then we become hierarchical again, like Ms. Dunn said. So there you go. Those areas of study are, are extremely fascinating. But one thing that was the biggest compliment to me when I first came to Armio was the ability to correct an extended essay for seniors. And mine were extended essays in Spanish. And um, it was a compliment to me because number one, the students never wrote anything of that length before. And two, they were exploring some aspect of their own culture, their own society by writing the essay about maybe the music from the North of Mexico or other things like that. So I'm thinking, well, everybody's talking about systems and powers and maps and how cultures group themselves, a whole different type of empowerment. Instead of having a council choose courses for ethnic studies, why not make that a research project for 11th and 12th grade students to say, what are going to be the courses of ethnic studies that are needed next year? Because after all, things in society could change. You know, COVID has changed everything remarkably. Um, why don't they make that a research project to recommend new ethnic studies courses each year and have the 11th to 12th graders make that their project to suggest those ethnic studies cultures, courses that empowers them before they leave for their next adventure. I think that would be brilliant. And I'm you just know, telling structure is another, oh, so sorry. Structure is another thing, right? You look at how we, uh, formulate papers, how we give speeches and presentations. It's a structure, introduction, body, conclusion. You have your, your attention getter to your thesis is, is in your introduction. Other cultures, more collectivist cultures, they, they uh, talk around a subject and then their thesis is at the end because what they're doing is that they're building a relationship, uh, right? Yeah. And before they tell you, oh, and by the way, this is my point. You know, so while we here, if you look at us in industrialized countries, like we, we're in a hurry, we got to get to get to the point and then elaborate, let's go, let's move on. It's like, let's talk, let's talk story. Oh, and by the way, here's what I mean. You know, even that from that dynamic is very different. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Ms. Dunn, and I, I, you're probably more up on this than what I am. Do you, do you have an opinion on why the state board took the action the way they did instead of doing something different? I really don't. Um, and I, and I, and, you know, um, I would have, I would hate to hazard a guess and put a, you know, put my own thinking into theirs. I'm not, I'm not sure what parameters they had to, to work within, because I know it, it, this whole thing has been a struggle. I mean, it's been a struggle to just, you know, it was a struggle to get the FAIR Act passed. I mean, lots of, you know, the uh, we've had, uh, it took a number of years to get bills passed. So I really don't know, but I would love to know why, because I, I really do have a big concern about this if we look at it as, to put it very bluntly, a cultural du jour, 
then I'm not sure we're really getting at the focus of, of where we need to be in, in an ethnic studies course. Thank you. I was just curious because I'm assuming with all with if you had had a chance to watch the hearings or anything no, else. I, haven't. So I was just curious. And I'm noticing the time and we have a couple more questions. And I think to respect all of the all of uh, your time, I think we can just end off with this really, really large question. Um, I am not scrolling the right way. <laughs> This question, what kinds of tangible changes do you think will come out of increasing the amount of ethnic studies or just having uh, more cultures represented, um, you know, in our school district? And I wanted to, you know, leave off with this question and I'll open it up to answers. My immediate reaction is that there are extremes, ex what's the word, intrinsic and extrinsic rewards for this kind of coursework. Uh, the extrinsic jobs. Can you research the ability of somebody to work for the United Nations or our government in the diplomatic corps because they understand cultures from around the world and are able to make people come to agreement about issues as they come along because they understand how they speak and how they think from where they came from. So that be there would be an extrinsic reward, um, and as someone who researches what kind of awards ethnic studies would promote, that would be a project of theirs unto themselves. Intrinsically, it's obvious um, the ability to communicate with people and understand how they're communicating with you because you understood where their history was from and you're able to sit down and relate to them offers you another connection with someone so that you both can grow in the world and be successful on a lot of different levels. And that's the intrinsic reward. Um, and I'll just leave my comment at that. My, mine is a much more um, simple answer, I think, um, because when I think of tangible changes, I have a great deal of faith in the students and the teachers and the leadership of our district. And I think that kind of what Ms. Rausch was saying as, as we have more primary sources available, as we have um, a, a greater breadth and depth of material I think that our students and our teachers and the leadership of our district, uh, when, you have, when you have the tools, you can build the machine. But if you don't have the tools, the machine is never gonna be built. So to me, a tangible outcome of discussions around ethnic study courses and the implementing of ethnic study courses. And I, I also like the fact that we have had a broad definition and that things can fall under ethnic studies that don't actually have that in the title. Um, and I think that's a really key point that we probably would have gone to in a six hour discussion. Uh, but I think that once we start thinking in that way and having the primary sources and the different kinds of materials, we're giving inquiring minds and intelligent leadership and high quality teachers the raw materials, the natural resources they need to take it wherever it goes. If I can just build on what Ms. Dunn is saying, I, you know, I'm looking at the, the recommendations from CDE and what just really stands out to me is promotes the value of civic engagement and promotes self and collective empowerment. And I think that the more that we can have any course in our district focused on those things, but especially our, our history, social science, or English language arts course that give students that lens of inquiry, if we can build in those opportunities, I hope to see that continue. So my answer isn't gonna quite answer your question because I don't think this is necessarily tangible, Jacob, but I will tell you this was what hit me in my heart when I read the question and it's more tolerant and less hate. 
I think also it would, people want to feel valued at the very end of it all, right? So no matter what culture we're from, we're at the very bottom of it all, we're human beings. And so once we learn to value people from different cultures, we see others as human beings, just like ourselves. And we learn to value others because that's, if we value ourselves, we'll value others. And I think that's, um, and then to treat each other better, I think that's really important. And that's what we're, where we can build from here. And again, I just come back to your generation leading the way. And I'm just so proud of you all. And I'm gonna get emotional here, but I'm just, thank you very much for inviting us all to this lovely discussion and for leading us through it. Thank you. You are absolutely welcome. Um, was there any other panelists that may wanted to add another comment? Well, I think all of us here had heard from a lot of different perspectives and um, it kind of opened all of our eyes, you know, the idea of I, I see you, we've all seen each other in kind of a different light, you know, we're ranging in from really young to um, <laughs> gonna do that age thing huh <laughs> i really hope that you know this is starting turning the wheels of all of you i know all of us here have some uh stakeholdership within the district and some individuals here have uh tremendous power within our district and you know I would love to see, you know, the expansion of our ethnic studies program in, in our district and just hearing from what's happening with the curriculum council. Very interesting to see. Uh, I just wanted to end tonight by thanking all of you for taking the time out of your day and participating in this discussion. Um, it has been eye-opening for myself, and I would probably have to, you know, speak on behalf of the other GenUp executive board members, and probably anyone who watches this, um, that this conversation is really propelling us forward, and, you know, starting us, starting that discussion of ethnic studies. You know, there's all this legislation that's coming down, and I've noticed one thing with our district, we're always one step ahead. For example, we have the state seal of civic engagement. I was able to work with uh, Dr. McCabe and a fellow other individuals. And we're, we now have that state seal of civic engagement in our district. And that's kind of, I started that conversation before it was officially uh, passed on the state level. And now to see that I have been able to make a lasting change, um, you know, allow students to strive for that civic engagement and be recognized by the district for it. It's kind of amazing to see that tangible change. And it's just all started with a conversation, a public comment at a governing board meeting. So I love, you know, and thank all of you for taking the time out of your day and being a part of this conversation. I really think this is going to propel our district even further uh, into the future. But with that, um, have a good rest of your evening. Thank, Thank you, Jacob.